This video will be discussing populations, and it's part of C4.1 on populations and communities, and this is all standard level or core content. When we refer to a population, what we're talking about is a group of individual organisms that are the same species and they're living and interacting in the same area. Of course, if you've studied species before, you know that species are individuals that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. So here I have a population of antelope, all the same species living and interacting in the same area. Oftentimes what we're asked to do is to estimate a population size. And it's important to say that we are estimating that we are not counting, especially for populations that are really huge. It's just impossible to count every single um, individual. But we do need to base it on evidence. We can't just guess. So what we need to do is we need to create a random sample. And a random sample is random if every member in that population has an equal chance of being selected. Okay, so what that might mean is that I might take my huge field and separate it up into, I don't know, like a hundred different grids and then count a few of them, select different grids at random. All right, there's a lot of methods that can help you with that. And if you know that you've counted, let's say 20% of the grids and you know how many individuals live in 20% of the grids, you can extrapolate to estimate a total population size but it is important that that be random. We will always have a certain degree of sampling error, and this is the difference between the true and estimated value. The larger your sample, so the greater the proportion of individuals that you count, the smaller your sampling error will be. We'll talk about a few different sampling techniques, one of which is the use of a quadrat. Now, a quadrat is a frame that is a fixed size. Usually, I use a meter by meter frame, okay? And we use this for random sampling, particularly when we, when we have sessile organisms. So sessile organisms are ones that do not move around. So things like this plant, you wouldn't want to use them for, let's say, birds, okay? So these sessile animals, what you would do is is you would mark your whole entire area boundary. So I can say, okay, here is the boundary, and I want to estimate the sample size. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my fixed frame, okay, my one meter by one meter frame, and I'm going to develop a random method for knowing where to lay down that frame. So what I typically do is I choose two random numbers. One is between one, zero and 360, and that tells me the direction that I need to walk, and the other random number that I choose um, is like between one and 100, and that's how many steps I need to take. Anyways, it's a way of generating a random sample, and so then you're gonna throw down your quadrat, you're going to um, count the number of individuals in that quadrat, and you're going to repeat that a few times. You're going to estimate how much of your total area you have covered with your quadrats, and then you can use that information to estimate a population size. So it's important here that we are gathering information, again, on sessile organisms, so that's important to remember, and that it has to be um, random samples. I can't just pick and choose where I'm counting. Now, there will probably be some degree of variability. So I might not be getting the same number of individuals in this quadrat as I do over here, as I do over here. You can actually calculate that degree of variability using something called standard deviation. So the larger my standard deviation, the more variable my data is. Now, quadrat sampling does not work very well for motile organisms, and that's because motile organisms are things that move. So it's really hard to count moving organisms. So I'm going to estimate their population size by calculating what's called the Lincoln Index. The Lincoln Index is an estimate for, for population size using a method called the Capture, Mark, Release, Recapture, and I love that because it's exactly what it sounds like. So let's say I want to estimate the population of a certain species of fish living in a pond. 
Well, I need to go out fishing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to capture some fish and I'm going to mark them. Okay, so let's say I capture 20 fish. Okay, I'm going to mark them and that is my variable M. So this is going to be a number, the number that you end up capturing and marking. Then I'm going to let all of those fish go. I'm going to come back and I'm going to go fishing in my pond again and I'm going to recapture a bunch of fish. This number that you recapture is designated as N. So this is a number um, that represents how many fish you got the second time around. This might be a hundred. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same number that you captured the first time. So that's really great. Okay, and then I'm going to calculate the Lincoln index using this formula. So I'm going to take the number that I marked the first time and I'm going to multiply that by the number that I recaptured. Okay, that's just a pure number and I'm going to divide that by R. R is the number that were recaptured with marks on them. Okay, so these are the ones that I basically caught twice. All right, so I'm taking, again, the number that I marked, the number that I recaptured, divided by the number of the ones that were recaptured that had those marks. And that will help me estimate my population size. What this assumes, however, are a lot of things. First of all, it assumes that there's no migration, which for a pond and fish might work. For an area of land or for nesting sites or for the ocean, that could be tough. It also assumes that there has been no deaths or births. Okay, so that assumes this is just allowing me to estimate numbers based on the proportion that I'm catching with marks on them. So it's not accounting for new organisms or organisms that died. It's also assuming that the marked and unmarked individuals have the same chance of being captured. So again, that's an assumption that's not always true. Maybe these fish were just real not great, not smart, very bad at being uncaught, okay? It also assumes that the mark remains visible, that whatever tag or mark you put on there didn't come off. And the last one, which is interesting, assumes that the marks do not affect survival. So it's also possible that whatever tag I put on my fish here is causing them to get eaten by predators or something like that. And so all of these assumptions um, are things that we have to think about when we are evaluating evaluating the reliability of the population size estimate that we're getting using the Lincoln Index. Now that we've talked about estimating population size, let's talk about population growth. So we're going to notice that in a certain environment, every population has what's called a carrying capacity. That is specific to each population and each habitat. It's the maximum population size that an environment can support. And this is because there are limited resources, okay? So for plants, that might mean limited amounts of water or light or nutrients. For animals, that might mean water or food or territory or oxygen. These scarce resources promote competition, and it's that competition that is going to determine um, which individuals survive and reproduce, but also how many individuals an environment can support. If we track population data over long periods of time, what we'll notice is that there tends to be a continual up and down cycle, lots of reasons for that, but that populations remain relatively stable over long periods of time. And that is because populations are under what we call negative feedback control. Okay, so negative feedback control means that there are factors in the environment that are bringing populations down when they get too high, but also allowing those populations to rebuild when they get too low. And so you may have some fluctuations, but over time they're relatively stable. There are a few different things that can affect population size. Some of those are going to be density independent, and that means they are the same no matter what the population size is. So something like fire might kill a bunch of organisms um, and might affect the population, but it doesn't matter if that population was living really densely, like there were a lot of them or not.
However, there are some things that are, are density dependent, and what this means is that they tend to have a bigger effect as the population grows. So things like competition is more fierce when we have a bigger population. Predation is easier when the population is bigger, and more diseases and parasites um, are able to infect hosts as those organisms are living um, more closely together. So again, all of these things are going to bring populations back down when they're getting too high, um, and then they'll become less and less important when that population is low, so then the population will grow, and then we have um, this up and down negative feedback loop cycle. So over time, if I have more breathing, like more births and fewer deaths, that is going to cause an increase in my population. Now, if I'm way over my carrying capacity, then those density dependent factors are really going to play a huge role. And so that's going to cause more deaths and fewer births. And so that's going to bring my population back down towards that carrying capacity. On the other hand, if I have more deaths and fewer births, that's going to cause a decrease in my population. And once my decrease in my population has dipped well below my carrying capacity, those density dependent factors become less important and that causes my population to go on the rise, okay? So once those density dependent factors become less of an issue, I'm gonna have more births and fewer deaths, and you can start to see how I'm going to get these cycles uh, over the year based on those density dependent factors initiating negative feedback control. Now that's only going to be for stable populations, but particularly when an organism starts to inhabit a new area, or if something has happened in an area that removes something like a predator or creates an abundance of a resource, we're going to notice an exponential population growth. And this is due to positive feedback. So reproduction causes exponential growth. Great example here is with the Eurasian collared dove. When they moved into a new environment and had a new need where they had a lot of resources, each dove could have like, let's say three babies um, and they were having three babies twice per year. So that's six chicks in a year. And each of those six chicks was having six chicks of their own and so on and so forth. So in the beginning, when organisms are first starting to occupy a niche, we're gonna get an exponential growth phase, okay? Eventually, some of those density dependent factors will start to cause our population to go up and down down and remain stable over time. So we tend to get this sigmoidal curve. If I take out all of these fluctuations and make this more of a, a smooth graph, you'll be able to see that we get this sigmoidal or S-shaped curve. And that's going to allow us to kind of separate this graph into two parts. So we'll have this exponential phase. That's what we're talking about here with this positive feedback. And then eventually that will transition into a plateau phase when those density dependent factors cause our population to hover right around that carrying capacity. Now you can actually simulate this. This makes for awesome IAs if you're in the market for an idea. Um, but to investigate carrying capacity, we can create a model. So you can almost create a mesocosm, like a small miniature environment. I recommend that you use something like duckweed, which is what we're seeing here, or yeast. It would be unethical to use animals. Um, but start with a small number of organisms and give them an abundant amount of resources. So what you're doing is really setting them up for that exponential growth part. And then as time goes on, you can estimate the populations and you can start to see at what um, uh, population size you reach carrying capacity. And so these are really great ways to investigate population size. They are models, so we have to think about what are the strengths and limitations. I can do a lot of trials. I can isolate and manipulate certain variables that might affect um, carrying capacity. But there's, of course, um, no way to mimic all of the complex and intricate interactions within an environment. So um, some really cool things, and I hope you 
you check them out and a great way to remind ourselves that theme C is all about interaction and interdependence. So when we talk about these density dependent factors, are we talking about carrying capacity? It's really important to keep in mind that all of these factors are interdependent when we are thinking about carrying capacity and population size.